Howdy, folks. This is a Mad Painter, and I'm here with Mark Eddy, and this is Open Canvas at uh, freedomslips.com, a.k.a. Uh, Revolution Radio. And I, I do believe we have a hat offer going. I'm not positive, so you might get me in trouble. But uh, for a $75 donation tonight, you get a, a Revolution Radio hat. And uh, pretty good deal. And uh, come come into the chat room. If you're not in the chat room, you're missing half the show. Yeah, How are you doing head, this evening, Mark? Oh, oh fine. Yeah. How, how like that would uh, keep your head warm on, you know, for th those of us who live in the north, getting pretty chilly. I had to break out the long johns. It got down into the 60s today. Oh, <laughs> jeez. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm reaching for my violin now. <laughs> so, so, uh, so how 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 warm's it been uh, during the days? Oh, that was the high today. I think it was like uh, 65. It's supposed okay, to get down in the, it's supposed to get down and freezing tomorrow night here. This will be the first time. Ooh. This is the first cold weather we've gotten. Okay. Well, it sounds. Uh, I I like the uh, Facebook uh, uh, you know posts that someone put up today about uh, you know winter uh, weather gear in Florida is a pair of socks over your sink. So I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> I've been so, known to wear them that way. So I uh, hope you enjoy. Okay, uh, enjoy the warm weather. It's you know we have to stay stay by the uh, uh, wood burning fireplace. But oh uh, well, well, we can talk about that uh, over the winter. Is uh, you know it keeps getting worse, and I'm already looking forward to May. But might as well get to our guest. Yeah, uh, our guest. Uh, tonight is a musician, UFO uh, researcher, lecturer, and contactee. Uh, I met Michael Lee Hill at the Serpa Mound uh, conference in, in September. You know, real nice guy, a lot of fun that day. Uh, we've had uh, uh, you know, like Chris Dunn on the show after, right after uh, that uh, conference. Um, I think we're looking at within the next few weeks maybe in, in, in early january uh you know ross hamilton was interested in uh returning to talk about a, a uh, updated book uh so yeah there, there's just a lot of nice uh friendships that that developed out, out of that conference and you know michael's one of them so uh welcome michael how how are you doing tonight I'm doing fantastic. You there? Yeah, that was a very cool conference. Oh, good. And, yep. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, a great yeah. conference. I, uh, like you said, a lot of friendships were uh, made, you know? And thank you for inviting me on uh, your radio show. Oh, you're welcome. We're, we're glad you're here. Uh, it'd be interesting to get Anara here to... Uh, do or that that singing stuff and uh i don't know how you the, the egyptian music i don't know how we could do that over skype but that uh that would be interesting indeed yeah music is so powerful and the singing bowls they use are very important yeah. because they're actually tuned properly you know we could get into that but uh, yeah, it was great meeting all these people and spending a lot of time at the Serpent Mound. You know, uh, we were camping right next door at the Soaring Eagle Resort, and boy, I had some really crazy extraterrestrial uh, activity you know, while we were camping there for about three days, which was mind blowing. Cool stuff. Did did did. Do you see any of the crop circles that have been reported from the uh, Serpent Mound area when you were there? Yeah, actually, uh, 
had a really strange thing happen. Um, right when I returned home from that conference, I was contacted by a person who told me that she was a investigator for the FBI, special investigator. And between us and all the listeners, I don't know, she just seemed very uh, – had an agenda to, to kind of knock me off my uh, – talking about this stuff and she went on to tell me that that crop circle was faked and uh you know just because of the conference and knowing about dr levin good's research into that um i post you know i put that information right back at her and said that's interesting because you know the scientist had explained that it was the real deal and the nodes were expanded and, you know, everything that she brought, it was just very fear-based. I ended up blocking her. I'm like, you know what? Your energy is just not really uh, conductive to uh, having a nice talk. So hope you have a nice life and see you. But, you know, it was really interesting because uh, I think you might know that while we were at the Serpent Mound, you know, this was on the fall equinox. And, uh, yeah, I've been doing work with uh, Star Knowledge family with tribal elders and Mm -hmm. you know i know where the vortex is at serpent mound and i did my own little ceremony and i put out the intention for the best outcome for humanity possible and i got up brushed myself off and the next thing i knew there was a black hawk helicopter that flew right over um the serpent mound and it was really low it came right over treetop level circled twice and then came right over the serpent and I uh, got a lot of really good pictures of that because there's a lot of people had their phones out. And, you know, you could actually see the people inside the Blackhawk. So it's been a really interesting time with, you know, everything that happened at the Serpent Mound. Yeah, so uh, was she a lady in black? Uh, you know, I. I just did not get a yes, you could say that. She seemed like she had an agenda and was trying to put me off the the mark of even speaking about this stuff and um and yeah. She didn't have good energy, <laughs> let me tell you that. Well, uh, that seems characteristic of you know the men or women in black. That's you know that's why they uh, disrupt our show from time to time. I'm sure, you know, they'll have you know a few notes jotted down uh, in our files for this discussion uh, next week. I'm sure they'll really be going uh, nuts with uh, Nick Redfern being here. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, they they definitely don't like the truth coming out. The subject. <laughs> the extraterrestrial subject, you know, is they've been really hard. At, matter of fact, we can get into that because of uh, I was pulled into a Skype conference with about six individuals because of some work I did with the remote viewers group who are actually in trans- technology transfer programs. And they told me why that they have kept this subject away from humanity for the last 25 years because they just stopped the spike tv show that i had finished filming which was supposed to air in uh the fall of 2012 and i you know since we're on this subject i guess maybe we can get into this right now but that show was uh censored and at the last moment it wasn't allowed to be aired and because i was working with the nsa remote viewers uh in a special behind the scenes project which we can get into um i was pulled into this conference and they said we want to tell you why your spike tv show wasn't allowed to be shown and why the subject has been withheld from humanity for the last 25 years and make a long story short they said it was free energy they said that once people know extraterrestrials are here it gets into their propulsion systems you know like how are they getting from point a to point b And uh, that gets into free energy. And they said, you don't even need extraterrestrial intervention. There's a lot of really intelligent humans who have figured it out anyhow, like Tesla. And uh, and by the 
I'm not saying I, I subscribe to this point of view, but I thought it was pretty interesting. They said that once free energy is re- released on a planet, it's kind of like Pandora's box. And uh, once the genie is out of the bottle, it can't really be put back in. And they said, what do you think that these people who have no regard for human life will do with their unlimited free energy? You know, what do you think ISIS members will do with it? And, uh, you know, my response was, first of all, I never really thought of that. Um, I thought it, it is an interesting talking point that, you know, what would you do with the people who will misuse this technology? But uh, I said, well, if we're all in agreement that there is higher intelligence as a, a play here, you know, extraterrestrial, why don't we talk to them? You know, I don't want to talk to Putin or, you know, Obama. Let's talk to some cultures who have got past this point of evolution maybe a million years ago and learn the futility of war and these thought forms of, you know, abusing your power over others. And uh, perhaps there's cultures out there that have went on, I'm sure, you know, because I think any culture would have to go through this phase of evolution of whether you... You know, if you grow technologically but not spiritually, a culture is going to implode, you know. And uh, let's talk to these cultures who have learned and got past it. So hopefully in the very near future, we can have that happen and sit at a much larger table, you know. Right. I, I fully agree. I think the reason we, we haven't had disclosure is because of the technology that would follow with disclosure. And it, 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 your point is well taken. It could be a dangerous thing. That's what they told me. They said, you know, I think it's created a bad loophole for the power for the powers that be who are these oil and banking families. You know, um, since the subject went under national security, it gives them a leeway to do some really horrible things. And you know, it's absolutely to me irrefutable that. Some scientists who have come up with free energy, they've been silenced. And But I think we're at a, a turning the page here. And uh, like I said, I think we need to go to a much larger table. And from what I understand, these conferences that are not on this planet, that have been held on Anunnaki motherships for the last 20 years. These are called link conferences. Um, this is exactly what they're talking about of how to – bring humanity into the next golden age as ripple free as possible. You know? so, um, Michael, so, you know, we, we can look at, you know, this, this might be jump, jump ahead a little bit, but you just brought it up. You know, the Adena were around for you know, a thousand or two years and, we are pretty much imploding in just uh, a decade. I think you know we, we've lost our the, the spirituality that they had. I would totally agree. I, uh, you know, uh, people have got to return to their roots, and you know, I think it'll help a lot when the control and manipulation of the oil and banking families over humanity, you know, to me, there's no doubt that they've been keeping humanity in a survival, you know, state of consciousness, uh, fight or flight, you know. Um, Once these things are alleviated, I think humanity will be able to show its true potential and flourish. And I believe, you know, some of the things that I've uncovered as far as even regarding free energy and what's been encoded into these ancient earth mounds is they've left us guideposts that will help us get to these new realities where mankind can finally, you know, show their true stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you know, one of the things that Ross brought up at the, the that conference was the, the corruption and moving away from some of the uh, core beliefs of the Adena culture, and it just got uh, started falling apart. 
And I think that's some, something that we're doing uh, today where, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, like you're t- talking about the you know, uh, elites manipulating us and, um, you know, the lady in black is, I'm sure she's reporting on uh, you to, you know, the black helicopter guys that are fl- flying around. I'm sure, you know, that's just no accident. So, so you know, why do we have to have all this reporting on other people? I'm sure uh, people are watching us through Skype. Uh, you know, I, I think it's just what they do, and it's what they've done for a long time, and they're just continuing on with what they've learned to do. But, you know, I think we're in good hands, actually. And I think, you know, these people are not multidimensional people beings where as the ones that we're talking about are truly multidimensional and i've got a confirmation of that from some very high sources um i guess even to get into that people would need to know that i'm a contactee and it's with what has become known the lake area ufos and it was these orbs of light that are showing up truly worldwide right now and you know these events are being covered in the media you know over phoenix over um texas over uh mexico you know the uk um but they're al- almost treated like they're isolated events and they have nothing to do with one another but once you see the news clips put back to back it becomes really evident they're the exact same phenomenon and they're flying in the same formations and uh what had happened is You know, I started seeing these objects over the lake around 2005, and I started to go down to Lake Erie and began to film them. And uh, I'd go down around sunset, and something flew by. I was ready to film it, and some of my footage started to go viral, and that brought the History Channel to my door. And, And it got really weird because the History Channel had just interviewed another uh, individual, his name was Terrell Copeland, and they interviewed him like two weeks before they came to the Cleveland area and, and interviewed me. And what I didn't know is uh, he had filmed the exact same objects I had, had the same story of contact and the same spiritual message given to him, um, which is that thoughts create reality, you know, that whole bit of information. But he had an unknown blood anomaly, and uh, they ended up flying both of us to Boston and had our blood work done by a Harvard professor. His name was David Sistrom, and that's when it was revealed that we both didn't have normal human blood. And uh, this gets into who the mound builders are, because I am Iroquois, and... uh, Matter of fact, the tribal elders have brought me into the Star Knowledge Conferences now to begin speaking. Uh, Chief Golden Light Eagle, who is the head of that, looked me in the eye and said, we need the Nephilim ambassadors. Um, Would you come and start speaking at the Star Knowledge Conferences? And I was really shocked. And actually, everything I've learned is being confirmed by these tribal elders. They know that the mound builders are truly the remnants of the Atlanteans. And uh, this has come through not only Chief Gold and Light Eagle, but um, one of the grandmothers of the tribal elders contacted me and said, we're really happy that you're releasing this information because she said within 5,000 years of oral history and 10,000, 5,000 years of written history and 10,000 years of oral history that they know that the mound builders are the remnants of the Atlanteans which is really fascinating. Um, So I think what's happening is in the very near future, exactly who the mound builders are and what they're bringing to the table, because they're still here. I'm haplogroup X, and we could get into why that's important. But like I said, I'm Iroquois as well. And they've encoded a lot of information into the actual mounds. People, a lot of them, a lot of people out there know that a lot of... uh, like equi- the, the equinoxes and moon phases are encoded into these structures. Um, but it's really fascinating to me because 
uh, I think we were speaking about this, Mark, but, you know, the Dina, the Hopewell, um, there is right now behind the scenes, there is plans being made to actually rename this Indian culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you find out like Hopewell was the name of a farmer who had these mounds on his land. And here in Eastlake, which is going to be revealed here in the very near future as the home base of the mound builders, uh, here they called them the Whittlesey or something like that. It's, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but they said it was the Whittlesey Indian culture. And here, that was the name of the army surveyor who surveyed it in the late 1800s. These are not proper terminology for this culture. And uh, so I'm really excited about the truth of all this being revealed. And it's going to be revealed through the tribal elders who actually have been in contact with these beings and have learned from them for a very, very long time. So, uh, what's the reason for renaming the cultures? Is, is it going to be for just the Hopewell or Hopewell and Adina? Do, do, do we know that? You know what I can tell you is... Uh, one determining factor of which cultures will be under this new label, whatever it is, it, it deals with who the mound builders are. And, you know, this gets into a, a whole other subject, but it's really tied into this. And that is what are harmonious cosmic frequencies? Because when you deal with the subject of sacred geometry, you know, you start to realize that everything from the atom to galaxies are using very specific geometry to create physical reality. And it's it's like people might know of the Fibonacci sequence or the golden mean and, you know, how these things incorporate into the construction of physical reality. Well, if everything is being created by geometry, you know, in the past, I thought the only way to get the geometry is through very high math, but just recently, because of a new scientific technology called cymatics, which cyma means wave, and is truly the technology of making the invisible visible, and this technology started off actually in the 1800s, and they would take a big uh, round metal plate and put sand on it and it was tuned to a specific note and they would take a bow like out for a violin and they would make the plate sound they'd watch the sand dance and geometry would form and it's not random it's uh every time you hit specific frequencies you get very specific geometry and that has evolved now to where they'll take a waveform generator and pump frequency through a uh, liquid media like water is the most prevalent one. And so what they have is a huge vat of water and it's suspended in a big tripod so no vibrations can get in it. And, you know, the only way I can start to explain this over a radio show without showing it to people is imagine you're in your car and you're going to do a frequency sweep through your radio stations. You start at the very bottom, you know, the lowest frequencies. And as you go to the right, Sooner or later, you're going to start to tune into a station. And at one point, there's going to be the most cleanest reception of that signal. And then as you continue on to the right, you're going to add more noise. And there's going to be more noise until that station is totally gone and all you have is noise. Then sooner or later, you'll tune into another station. Well, in the exact same way, imagine that now you're pumping frequency through water and you're starting with low frequencies. And as you do a sweep to higher frequencies, you're going to see at very specific points that geometry forms in the water. And at that point, you can look and see, well, what frequencies are we at? And what you find out is there's a very cosmic frequency and it's 432 hertz. And First of all, what you find out is the Anunnaki gave us our method of keeping time back in Sumeria, pre-Egypt. And uh, it's pretty well known now that just out of the bat, that Sumerian culture was really advanced. They had the first culture that had math and art 
timekeeping was from Sumeria, and we still use it today with, uh, you know, 12 hours in a day, 12 in a night. And, you know, the interesting thing is any of your listeners can do this. Check out how many seconds are in 12 hours. It's 43,200. It's 432, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. That's amazing to me because... First of all, any time that you're dealing with frequency, say you have a, an A note on a piano tuned to – your A is tuned properly to 432 because what you find out, our musical standard in the 1940s was changed to 440 hertz. An A note equals that now. And if you put 440 through this exact same scientific equipment – you get no geometry. It looks like a puddle. It's actually one of the most disharmonious frequencies uh, that you can choose. But if you tune it properly to 432 hertz, all of a sudden it's like you've taken a focus on a camera and everything comes into perfect focus. And anytime you're dealing with frequency, if you want to get to a lower octave, and an octave is one whole complete cycle lower, and the easiest way a non-musician can understand this is everyone's went up to a piano, and you know, there's an A note in the middle that's going to be 432 hertz. Well, there's also, to the left, another lower A note, then another lower A note, and another lower A note. To get to those other frequencies, all one has to do is divide by two, or if you want to get to... Uh, higher frequencies, double it. So, it, for instance, if you want to get to the lower octave of uh, 432, it would be 216, because 216 and 216 is 432. And then 108, and then uh, 54 and 27, because 27 and 27 is 54, 54 and 54 is 108. 108 and 108 it's 216, 216, and 216 is 432. 432, 432 is 864. Well, if there's 432,000 seconds in 12 hours, it's 864, uh, you know, for a full day. And that's the higher octave of 432. Why this is even important is these, what I've discovered is these earth mound sites like in Newark, Ohio, and all over Ohio, Pennsylvania, and uh, New York, are in, incorporating these frequencies. For instance, you'll find some of the walls are 1,080 feet long. Well, that's 108. You know, another wall will be 2,160. That's 216. Um, and they're actually encoding multiple octaves of 432. And mind you, like I said, it, you find out that this whole system uh, was given to us by the Anunnaki back in Sumeria. So it totally ties in with the mound builders and who they were because they truly are the Nephilim, which was the Anunnaki human hybrid on this planet. And I feel it's really important because I'm sure even a lot of your guests, I've noticed a lot of researchers who bring the Nephilim into a negative light. And they say that they're the ones truly who are behind the oil and banking families and they're pulling the strings. And I ask, well, what are those, what does that have to do with the native American Indians? Nothing. You know, matter of, matter of fact, you know, the native American Indians have suffered under the, the wheels of that machinery, which is truly the, uh, the remnants of the Roman empire through these European oil and bank banking family secret societies it has nothing to do with the Nephilim. Uh, so I think that's important for people to know because right now so many people are really fearful of the Anunnaki subject and the Nephilim subject because they're believing this propaganda that's putting it all into a negative light. When And you find out like Atlantis, Edgar Cayce called them uh, Poseidians. And Poseidon had another name even previous to that, and that was Inky of the Anunnaki. And Inky was known as the water bearer, and any time he was depicted in ancient Sumerian uh, petroglyphs or whatever you want to call that, he would have either water erupting from his shoulders or he would be holding buckets of water or pitchers of water. And while well, a man holding a pitcher of water is Aquarius, you know, all of the Neptune, Poseidon, they're all different labels of this Anunnaki 
a person named Inky. And uh, so you find out the Nephilim was actually brought onto Atlantis. And, you know, when the last breakup of that, which there was actually three breakups. One was 50,000 years ago. One was about 25,000 years ago. And that was the biblical flood event. And then 10,500 years ago was the last breakup. And the elders stayed behind, so to speak. And the last time of the breakup of Atlantis, which was between the North American continent and the European continent. For the first time, they went to the left and they came up into the bottom of the North American continent. And the first indigenous people that they met were the Mayans. And they showed them, you know, the Mayan calendar and pyramid building and whatnot. But um, once darkness started to settle in and, you know, like the whole them starting to sacrifice others and whatnot, you know, these mound builders or the Atlanteans or Poseidians, whatever you want to call them, decided to keep moving north up through the continent and kept going until they basically dead ended on Lake Erie and East Lake Ohio and uh, then started to spread out both to the right and left and became what is known now as the Hope Well and, you know, all these other cultures. Um, but I find it very fascinating that because why this is so important for even the concept of free energy is everyone knows Einstein's uh, equation E equals MC squared. Well, E equals energy, M is mass, and then C is the speed of light. And, you know, our top scientists now know, like quantum physicists, they tell us that everything is both particle and wave simultaneously. Well, that's only one part of the equation then, because it's right there in it, mass, you know, there's no frequency component. But when you find out 432 squared is the speed of light within 1% accuracy. Well, then the 432 frequency is truly a component of light. And it's right up there with the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> in, indeed, indeed. It all comes together then, you know. And so the only frequencies that are going to connect that circuit and work its way back to E, energy, is frequencies that are in the 432 hertz frequency grid, you know, because that's only the A note. You have all these octaves of A, but then you also have all the other seven notes of a musical scale. And they're, you know, if you're tuned to 440, it's interesting because no matter where you go, you can go to different octaves, you can go to a different note. There's no geometry formed at all. But once you back it off to 432, Perfect geometry is formed no matter where you go. If it's a different octave, you get perfect geometry. And by the way, the lower the frequency, the more simpler the geometry. But it gets really interesting because, you know, four octaves below 432, which is 27 hertz, uh, using this scientific equipment, you pump a 27 hertz frequency through it. And what you get is a perfect seven-pointed star. And this is really important because uh, in 2011, a crop circle showed up in Italy and it was signed for the first time ever. It was signed by the creator of the crop circle. And in ASCII binary code running around the outside of that seven pointed star was the name Ia Space Inky, which who we're just talking about, you know, Poseidon, Neptune whatever you want to put to it. Well, you also find out that the seven-pointed star, first of all, it's the Cherokees symbol of their their people, you know? That's interesting in itself. But in the Babylonian world map that sits in a museum right now, it's also a seven-pointed star. But um, they've been trying to guide us into the importance of the 432 hertz frequency since day one, you know, really back in Sumeria for our culture in the actual system of timekeeping that they gave us, which, you know, by all means, the lowest is a second. I know there's milliseconds or whatnot, but for most of timekeeping, it's the second is the lowest, you know, on a wristwatch or whatever. Right. Um, and then you find out that the same information, 432 base re- uh information is encoded in the earth mounds and is showing up in crop circles right now. And what's really interesting is not only did the seven pointed star 
show up in a crop circle in 2011, but in 2010, in the exact same location in Italy, was another crop circle. And when it was also encoded with ASCII binary code, and when that was decoded, it turned out that it was E equals MC squared. So exactly what we're talking about, these two different crop circles are pointing to the two different uh, pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. And I think it's really cool. And I'm, I'm glad I'm going to be presenting all this information at the next upcoming Star Knowledge Conference, which is in Estes Park, Colorado. And that's uh, next month, actually. So it's cool stuff. So, uh, Michael, there's uh, all have had a uh, question in the chat room about so did, did someone like the Anunnaki uh, invent time? No, actually, you know, the, the, there is no such thing as time. <laughs> this gets into a really weird concept, but that movie with uh, Matthew McConaughey, Interstellar, got into this. And actually Einstein, uh, uh, some people might know of Einstein's twins paradox. And that basically states if one twin got in his rocket ship and traveled near the speed of light for five years, turned around, came back to Earth. When he arrived back at Earth, his brother that stayed on the Earth 500 years or whatever, you know, depending on what speed he traveled, might have passed. And, uh, and this gets really strange because if you think about those two brothers, each of their wristwatches are still clicking one second equals one second, you know, one second at a time. And there's no problem until one tries to come back into the other one's time frame. And this actually gets into why the Homo sapien species was even created by the Anunnaki, because in the same way, you know, our, our science now has confirmed what Einstein said and like take an airplane or a jet, if you put an atomic clock in a jet airplane and then have another atomic clock on the surface of the planet and you both – you make them correlate with one another, once the jet goes off and it flies for a couple hours, even at that little more speed than the Earth-based uh, clock, when it lands, there will be a couple milliseconds off. And the faster you travel, the faster your perception of time changes. So, you know, the Anunnaki – had found out that this planet had a lot of gold. And so, you know, they started to come here to mine this gold because it was a do or die situation for them. They uh, needed it to, they would put it into a powderized form and put it up into their atmosphere to shield it from solar radiation when it came through our part of the solar system. Because, uh, you know, what's come out through people like Zachariah Sitchin is that this planet is truly a part of our solar system. And most solar systems we now know are binary star systems, which means there's two suns in each solar system. But as everyone knows, suns can go through th these life phases, and uh, some can actually become black holes. Some can become, you know, supernovas or, you know, black stars. That, you know, they, they shrink in size, but all the mass is still there, and they go dark. And... This is what happened to our binary sun long ago, but all of our planets we know of orbit our sun. But one planet in particular, and we call it Nibiru, um, I've learned from them that's not what they call it, but we can get into that in a minute. It traveled way out in the deep outer space and would orbit around this other dark star, and uh, it took... 3,600 years for it to make its orbit and come back through our part of the solar system. And uh, this is what caused a lot of problems for us in the past is, um, well, every 3,600 years when it comes through, it's not a catastrophic event. It would be in our geographical record and it's not. Um, but uh, if it comes between Mars and Jupiter through its transit through our part of the solar system, we're pretty much fine, you know, but if it comes between Mars and Earth, well, we're screwed. We have nothing to buffer the effects that it'll have on our tectonic plates and whatnot. So what had happened was the same way, you know, if traveling at a different speed like Einstein's twins paradox or even a jet airplane flying changes 
you know, how you perceive time literally. Well, each planet is traveling at a different rate through the ether. And the way, uh, you know, even though this sounds really bizarre, you know, some of your listeners might be hip on the subject of like stargates and that there's truly functioning stargates in some of the secret bases, like in Pine Gap, Australia, on this planet. And what I was told, if you walk through that stargate and when you walk through the other end of the, the room, you set foot on the Mars, well, if you tried to communicate back to Mars, you would be communicating in Earth's past right now. Um, which is bizarre, but because of the Anunnaki who came here, they became known as the heroes because truly it was, they considered a death sentence, you know, uh, to come here. And they were actually going to have a civil war because some of the workers that were coming here were starting to go on strike, so to speak. And this was a do or die situation, like I was saying. And um, so one of them, Inky, again, decided well, there's no indigenous life form on this planet who could help us with this toil and labor. You know, what if we increase the intelligence of a primate that was on this planet by genetically introducing some of their own DNA and upstart this, you know, uh, primate's intelligence to where it could take orders, so to speak, and uh, here we are, right? <laughs> but um, it also gets into why the Nephilim, who are the mound builders, you know, that's truly what's going to be revealed of who these people are, especially now, since, you know, the Anunnaki are returning. Who do you consider the Nephilim? Uh, the Nephilim? Because there's a lot of different, you know, versions. I, I understand what you mean, but I don't know if yeah. the listeners understand Right on. Well, in the Bible, uh, it says that the Elohim, which is a different name for the Anunnaki, um, this gets into a weird subject, though, because not all Anunnaki are Elohim. What you find out is the king of this planet, Nibiru, his name was Anu, and his firstborn son was named Ea, who became known as Inki because Inki is not a name, it's a title. It's kind of like a Dalai Lama. And N means Lord, Kai means Earth, so he was Lord of the Earth. Um, and, uh, you know, Inky himself was the first hybrid w among the Anunnaki. His father at this point had a female wife who was not Anunnaki. She was Elohim or wing maker or whatever you want to, you know, there's many titles, but the point is for the first time ever, they had new DNA and new blood coming into the Anunnaki family tree. But what happened was after Inky was born, Anu, his father stopped that relationship with the Elohim woman. And this is important because in the Bible, it states that the Elohim had a hybrid human Elohim hybrid bloodline on this planet, and they called them the Nephilim. So this is all related. Um, when Anu stopped this relationship with the Elohim female, he then partnered with an Anunnaki wife and had another son, and his name was Enlil. And, uh, you know, make a long story short, obviously at first Inki was prince. And he was raised to take the throne. His father was the king. But according to their own succession of kingship, you know, a, a pure blood would get the throne over a half blood, which, you know, so the throne went to Enlil and he became known as the, you know, the Jehovah of the Bible, you know, the one that didn't look favorably on mankind anyhow. Um, so the Nephilim, that's who they are, you know, even in the Bible. You know, if people want to look into it, it's in the first chapter, Genesis. It says the Elohim had a human Elohim uh, hybrid bloodline on this planet. And what I'm here to reveal is that Nephilim bloodline uh, comes through the mound builders and the Native American Indian side. And this is now proven in new DNA uh, information that has been on covered and this was only in 1998 by the way so this isn't that long ago um there was a brand new haplogroup 
which haplogroups are how scientists can study DNA and track the lineage of any bloodline back in time and see mm-hmm. specifically where it comes from. And up until 1998, they had found what they called haplogroup A, B, C, and D, and all of these tribes that came into uh, the North American continent would fall under these four haplogroups. Um, but in 1998, they found a brand new haplogroup, and they named it haplogroup X. And people can go and type that in, haplogroup X, and research it yourself, and you'll see what I'm saying. But haplogroup X had a mutation within it, and it's actually the oldest bloodline on this planet, and it's called haplogroup X2A. And what you find out is haplogroup X2A is only found in three places on this planet. One is from the skeletal remains that have been removed out of these mounds, usually giants, you know, or skeletons of very tall stature. But what's interesting is still to this day, at least 3% of the Native American Indian tribes have haplogroup X, X2A specifically. Is, is that your and they said it could be your blood? Yes, indeed, and it does run through mainly the uh, you know the the highest percentage of haplogroup X two A is among the Indian tribes that were among or located around the Great Lakes. Um, and yes, I am haplogroup X. I am Seneca, uh, Iroquois on my mother's side, and Erie Montauk on my father's side. Um, and both are, you know, haplogroup X2A. But what's interesting is after the History Channel revealed I didn't have normal human blood, this was in March of 2008 is when that episode aired, and it was called Alien Contact. Well, in the summer of 2008 is when I was first met by the Anunnaki. And at this point, because of my being adopted, I didn't know my heritage. I had no clue. They approached me, and I'm talking in the physical, I'm not talking channeling or anything. They met me at a festival where I went to, and they told me we had been known in your past as the Anunnaki. And at this point, there was no ancient aliens on TV. I didn't know what an Anunnaki even was. Um, They told me that I was of the Nephilim bloodline, and this would all make sense in the future. And in late 2008 is when I met my biological mother for the first time and my two sisters, And I found out of my uh, Iroquois Indian heritage, and now it's all coming to fruition. Um, But haplogroup X2A is the key. And like I said, here's a very interesting talking note, because even with scientific testing now, the mound builder skeletal remains, which is usually giants, are haplogroup X2A, but so is at least 3% of the Native American Indians still to this day have the same DNA, but they're no longer giants. That's a fascinating talking point right there because a few generations ago they were, but now they're not. So something's been still going on. Uh, I believe it could tie into why the whole abduction phenomenon, you know, the genetic work hasn't really ended. Um, But uh, this also gets in, I know a lot of uh, other researchers look at this as the fall, you know. I don't think it was. I think it was planned on purpose for the Nephilim to do what they were intended to do, which was to try to steer this experiment, which was implemented very long ago with the Nephilim, because, uh, you know, we can get into why this was, and it was the creation of mankind, and what had happened was... Very long ago, you know, the last pole shift, you know, which is the crust slips around the earth and it causes, you know, what became known as Noah's flood myth, you know. Well, uh, they, the Anunnaki scientists knew that the the crust was going to slip. And since Enlil had the throne and he didn't look at the creation of mankind very favorably anyhow, he was like, well, it must be God's will. Let him perish. Well, that wasn't – it didn't sit well with Inky because Inky was the scientist who actually created mankind. Or I don't even know if the word created is correct, uh, tweaked or, you know, manipulated the DNA. 
and he looked at us us as family. So instead of listening to his own race, he went to his mother's side and said, you know, isn't anything, isn't there anything that could be done because my race is going to let this beautiful race that has so much potential perish. And they said, well, if we do this arc experiment, you know, that you're uh, proposing, will mankind evolve fast enough anyhow for the end of this grand cycle, which would have been 2012. So this is like 20, 25,000 years or so into the future. And the answer was no, because even in the ancient Anunnaki uh, or Sumerian cuneiform tablets where this is all written, they called the place on this planet where mankind was brought into the Eden. Well, that sounds familiar, right? And truly, it was a very Edenic uh, place where, you know, People like to say mankind was created as slave labor. Well, that truly, I guess if you want to look at it that way, but it was, from what I understand, we were more like pampered pets, you know, that there was no homeless, there was no starvation. People were treated kindly and they knew the Anunnaki existed. They could go to a pyramid and go and meet one of them, which is actually depicted in the Sumerian cuneiform as well, where, you know, you'll have this giant with, you know, half size individuals coming up to them um so make a long story short because this gets really involved you know inky's mother's side said well if they they aren't going to evolve fast enough to be ready for this dimensional shift is there anything that we can do to help them evolve on a consciousness level faster so this they think tanked it if you want to look at it that way and they thought what if we made mankind experience its own mental energy in an accelerated fashion both light and dark, you know, unbiasedly that because they understood that thoughts create reality and that mental, you know, thoughts have energy, like mental energy. We're like broadcasting frequency when we think. And if, you know, thoughts of this kind of gets into Dr. Emoto's work too. He was the, I think it was Japanese scientists who learned to photograph water molecules as they would crystallize. And if you typed, I love you, they would look like snowflakes. But if you typed, I hate you, or you can't do that, it would look like sludge again. And uh, so, you know, I guess the point is, how do you transmute a negative thought form? Well, the answer is you live it. It comes up in your own personal reality. And if you choose love, over fear, you'll transmute those thought forms into their higher octaves. But if you don't, the same crap will keep coming up in your life. You go, why does the same crap keep happening to me over and over again? Well, it's because those thought forms haven't been, been transmuted. And so they decided to implement this experiment of bringing duality into the human psyche so we would experience our own mental energy in an accelerated fashion and Inky's mother side said well that's really interesting but you can't just do that it's never been tried in all of the bigger picture you know the bigger universe the multiverse this was a brand new thought that had never been tried to you know artificially accelerate the the evolution of a race and uh, Graham Hancock had a very good Uh, covering of what this bed of information is. And he came across this mural that was on a ancient temple and he called it the myth of the churning of the milky ocean. And what it said was, you know, the most important part of this myth was the milky ocean itself, because in their own mindset, it was that milky ocean is what the whole multiverse sat in. And, you know, all of the universes and all of the solar systems and suns were sitting inside of this milky ocean. And this milky ocean had t- two teams Michael, of churn. Michael, yes? we're fixing to go to break. Can you hold that thought? This right is on. interesting. We'll be <laughs> right, right, on, right back, on. folks. <laughs> cool. Before we get going on the second part of the show, I do want to remind everybody that we are totally listener supported. So if you got a buck or two, we'd sure appreciate it. A uh, good way to help out is uh, get the archives, uh, $5 a month. There's like uh, 36 hours of shows uploaded uh, uh, in a 24-hour period. You couldn't listen to them all unless you were a time traveler. Mark, uh, you want to get right back into this? I'm finding this extremely interesting tonight. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, my, uh, yeah we're here with uh, Michael Lee Hill. 
And I think at the end of the last hour, you were talking about the uh, Milky Way. Uh, Milky Water. Uh, uh, yeah. The, 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 water the myth of the train of the Milky Ocean. <laughs> Yeah, okay. yes. that, 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 that's it. I'm sorry. And so do, you, do you want to finish that? Then we can get into the uh, uh, creatine uh, cr- crinase. That you're, crinase. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, well, what we were saying is, you know, because of the Anunnaki scientists seeing that, that there's going to be this crustal displacement, you know, a pulse shift, that um, they were – they had decided just to let us perish because they – there was no real way to – for them to try to help 400 million humans that were on the planet at this time. Inky goes to his mother's side and says, hey, isn't there anything that can be done? My race is going to let this beautiful race perish. And so they had decided that even if they did save us in this ark, which wasn't two of every animal, by the way, it was a DNA library, which obviously, but the answer was no, we weren't evolving because we were brought into their own term was Eden and there was no catalyst for change. You know, we were had everything taken care of for us. And because of that, we weren't evolving very fast. So they said, well, if this race isn't going to evolve enough to, you know, weed out the fear and doubt out of their own belief systems, what could be done? So what I was saying is Graham Hancock came across this mural and it's called the myth of the churning of the milky ocean. He said the most important part of the myth was the milky ocean itself, because in their own mindset that's where the whole multiverse laid and so there was a two teams of churners a team of light and a team of darkness but what was concealed in this was they weren't at war with one another they were actually working in cooperation to churn the milky ocean to help mankind evolve into the higher levels so taking this analogy think of the anunnaki uh uh, becoming two different teams, one who would reflect back a negative polarity. It's almost like they would scan the mass consciousness of humanity. And if someone was vibrating fear, they would make sure you got a chance to experience your own dark thought forms because they know that truly that's the only way that they can be transmuted is we each have to transmute our own dark baggage and there was a team of light and i think this explains too why a lot of people if you just concentrate on team bad cop it's going to look pretty ugly because if you're a human that had a lot of fear and doubt and garbage in your own belief system and you come across a multi-dimensional being whose spiritual purpose it is to make you experience your own dark baggage, you're probably going to view them as a demon because they're making you experience your own darkness. But um, what had happened was the, you know, Inky's mother's side, the elders said, well, you know, since this experiment, of this arc isn't going to work, what could we do? And they think, tank didn't came up with this idea of making us experience our own mental energy faster uh but uh what this gets into is when they first tried to incarnate into the human vessel to try you know this was in service to help and like i was saying you know if you look at team bad cop and that's all you look at it's going to look pretty ugly but you know some people realize that the anunnaki have had a very positive effect on mankind and they've given us agriculture and architecture and you know uh, sacred geometry and music and trying to guide us into the higher realms of truly how light and sound create physical reality um but so getting back to them trying to create this nephilim bloodline um once they tried to incarnate and they would spontaneously combust because the human vessel wasn't capable of holding that kind of energy, they thought, well, what else can be done? They thought, well, what if we make an offshoot of the human genome that has more chi or, uh, you know, electrical capacitance at a cellular level? And how this was accomplished was, and this is really interesting because it's what the Harvard professor, David Sistrom, unveiled in the history channel show uh, ufo hunters alien contact was every human has their brains release an enzyme called creatine kinase and it's usually 25 parts per liter of blood is the normal levels and if you've had some kind of muscle damage or ripped a muscle or had some type of bodily damage your brain will increase creatine kinase levels to about 250 to about 300 tops Sometimes it can get up to about 350, but that's kind of rare. 
Um, and the reason that the brain releases extra creatine kinase into the bloodstream is it brings extra oxygen into the bloodstream to facilitate healing. And what you find out is the more oxygen in the blood equates to how much electrical capacitance you're holding on a cellular level. Extra creatine kinase brings oxygen, which brings extra energy. And if the normal parts are 25 parts per liter of blood, what they revealed, and like I said, this is a Harvard professor, it's not my opinion. Mine was at 2100. Where So wow. if you can, normal's 25, my blood creatine kinase levels are at 2100. Really, you could think of it as very super oxygenating the bloodstream, and it brings a lot more chi, you know, into the human vessel, which is exactly what we're talking about, why the Nephilim was even created. Um, So that, you know, is the backstory on why the Nephilim was even created. But what I can tell you is uh, since... I call them team good cop and team bad cop. And, you know, these are the two different sides of the coin of the Nephilim. And this would have been brought in 25,000 years ago. And in the Sumerian kingship list, you'll find that, you know, these beings live very, very long lives. And they were, it's stated when they're going to take the throne of either the earth realm or Nibiru, the planet they come from. There's two different thrones. And, um, you know, since they live almost a mortal life because of their knowledge of genetics, um, very long into the future, it's already stated at this age of the processional cycle, uh, you know, such and such will take the throne. Well, at this time period, it was Marduk, was Inki's son. He became known as Ra in uh, Egypt. Uh, He was slated to take the throne of the earth realm, but he didn't know that this experiment was going to be even implemented, and he was taking the throne of the earth during this time period, and he was the one that took on the role of on a spiritual level of reflecting back a negative polarity. So you can imagine all these bloodlines and secret societies who have truly chosen to misuse their power over others are catering to Marduk, who is there to make them experience their own mental darkness, you know? Um, so it's a whole different telling. And actually, a lot of what we're talking about, that, that puts in getting kicked out of the garden into a whole new light. You know, and yeah. some of these some of these stories, too, like, you know, some people try to make the Anunnaki into these horny space dudes that were just thought these creations that they made were hot and they came down and had sex. <laughs> and, you know, that's like the lowest con- common denominator of telling what happened. It was truly being in service to mankind. Um, but what I can tell you is think about all of the stuff that's happened and even with these the darkness that's set in. Um, We've been under this experiment to accelerate both light and dark thought forms for a very long time. They told me when I met them that everything in their own succession of kingship and how they relate to humanity is based on what's called the processional cycle. And at that time, I didn't even know what the processional cycle was. But they said with the upcoming age of Aquarius, which, again, that's the age of Inky. He is the man holding the buckets of water. Uh, that we would enter a new time of how for mankind itself. And I can tell you, they said it was February 14th, 2009. And they said the first day of the age of Aquarius, this experiment of accelerating human conscious evolution was done and over with for this cycle at least. And uh, they told me that it might, it's, it's really scary looking out there right now, but we've made it. That we have earned the right be, to be treated as equals. And they're now, uh, they call them event strings, you know, creating synchronicities and divine coincidence behind the scenes to orchestrate mankind into the higher realms. And from what I understand, 
they said that this is the first time ever in, you know, Kali Yuga's, by the way, are 432,000 year long cycles. And um, by the way, there's 432 again, right? Um, that uh, this is the first time mankind will ever go through this mutation of the caterpillar into the butterfly, that we're going to go through a metamorphosis into our true light bodies. And this would be happening very quickly because once all this starts to be revealed and we see their temples fall, you know, and we, you know, people are becoming aware of the, the bullshit, you know what I mean? Of the federal reserve and what these people have done that once these dominoes start to fall, uh, they all fall. And I can tell you the Knights Templar are very uh, involved in all this. And, you know, they truly have the financial wealth and actual backing material to free humanity on an economic level. And it's fearful as it gets out at the outside of appearance of things. Just I want the listeners to know that there's better systems, you know, if humanity is truly going to become a galactic society, which I, that's what I believe this is all leading towards, um, all the systems that are truly not just in, for the whole of humanity, if they only benefit the pocketbooks of a few wealthy oil and banking families, right. well, they got to go. You know, they have to be replaced with true galactic systems that work for all. And uh, I'm excited. I think very soon we're going to be seeing these dominoes start to fall. And if it wasn't that there were things waiting in the wings to replace them, you know, I think it would cause a lot of panic. And it's, uh, I personally, yeah, I, when I start to see the economic system crumble, which it already is, I'm I'm ecstatic because, by the way, they did tell me be, long ago before I even met them when I started to have contact telepathically. This was when Bill Clinton was president. They said when I seen the economic system of our United States begin to crumble, um, that would be the sign that we're very close to first contact. And I thought at that time – the economy was so booming, you know, it made no sense to me whatsoever. But for me, when I see all this, you know, the revealing of how the Federal Reserve truly ain't anything beneficial, you know, it's throwing a lot of people into fear because they, they're they fearing their money's just going to disappear and whatnot. But to me, it's the best news ever, you know. Well, Personally, I can't wait for it to hit the fan. Yeah, I'm bringing the fan closer. (laughs) (laughs) Michael, this is one of the nice things about uh, Facebook and Internet radio is there there is an element of the Photoshop stuff, uh, but there, there are people who are working harder to get the truth out there than... Uh, people in the mainstream. So, you know, may, you know maybe uh, you know there is a lot of good coming out of uh, uh, what we're doing on shows like this. Absolutely, I. Uh, you know, from what I understand, this I'm talking about uh, the internet in, in general. You know, with going back to reverse engineering alien technology from Roswell, and this gets into uh, Philip Colonel Corso. Uh, There's a book release called The Day After Roswell, which uh, kind of gets into he was the person in charge of farming this technology out to uh, mainstream and them releasing the transistor and uh, integrated uh, circuits and, you know, it was truly the revealing, the releasing of light on this planet. The internet is them losing control over the output of information. Up until this, they controlled all outlets of knowledge and information. By the way, that's what they told me when they pulled me into that meeting. They said, you know, for a very long time, we have been in control of this information that gets released to humanity. And they said, here you are with your 
YouTube page with four over four million views, and you know your History Channel show is one of the most popular episodes and has been re-aired millions of times. And you're saying whatever you want, and we're cut out of the loop totally. How do you think that makes us feel? And I was like, yeah, none of your business, really. You know what I mean? This is my life, and uh, and like I can tell you some things that people might not know, and I think it's really uh, uh, some cool information. And because of my contact with the Anunnaki. And, uh, you know, these orbs of light over Lake Erie. In 2011, there was mass sightings over Lake Erie. And these objects continually showed up over the lake day after day. And it got to be about 10 days in a row. And it made it all the way to and, – and, wait a minute. I'm going to start that over again. It got to MSNBC and uh, because hundreds of people were going down along the lake and seeing these for themselves. And other people were – filming them well at this time i was contacted by bigelow aerospace um if people don't know who bigelow is um they might know of the skinwalker ranch in utah um they're the owners of well robert bigelow owns bigelow aerospace and robert bigelow uh knew that they, there was this activity over this utah ranch called the skinwalker ranch and by the way uh, they're called skinwalkers because of the Native American Indians in that area would see these orbs of light come down and take on biological life forms, such as giant wolves that were the size of small deer. And um, so I got contacted at this time period by a Bigelow investigator. And he said, I'm contacting you. His name was Gary Hernandez, by the way, which is a cool thing is, you know, some UFO researchers have taken it upon themselves to confirm he is who I said he was. He's on LinkedIn. Um, so, and it's right there. He worked on classified projects for Bigelow Aerospace for years. Uh, he said, we know that what you're in contact with is the real deal because it's what we've been studying over the Utah Skinwalker Ranch for over 20 years now. And, you know, this gets into a cool thing because he also pointed me into the right direction. He said this is the same phenomenon that's showing up over Hastalen, Norway. And he pointed me towards some of the uh, released information from the UK Ministry of Defense. And in the UK Ministry of Defense, it said that the real deal is these orbs of light. And they don't know how they can form and keep their shape and form, but they can divide and separate into two and then three, come back together. But it said in some type of process that's unknown to mankind that three of these orbs of light could come together and somehow form one giant triangular craft which accounts for these huge triangular craft that are being seen all over the planet well, like stop the phoenix and... lights indeed okay indeed. so you need to wrap your head around this what these two the highest levels of information on this planet bigelow aerospace and the uk ministry of defense are releasing is that these orbs of light can become anything biological or technological in our physical reality well that's a whole new ball game ain't it you know and what i learned from the bigelow investigator he said some of the weirdest phenomenon at the skinwalker ranch they labeled it um poltergeist activity because it was multi-dimensional uh, activity, you know, and for instance, there, you know, Bigelow, Robert Bigelow staffed that place with scientists who lived there 24 seven and they would have to, they live there. So they have to eat, obviously they'd go to the grocery store, come back and unpack all the groceries from the bags into the refrigerator and cupboards, and then walk to the next room and realize, Oh, I'm going to go grab me a can of Coke or whatever and walk back into the kitchen and everything that they just unloaded were back in the garbage bags. I mean, not garbage, uh, grocery bags. Um, and there's almost like this intelligence was just there letting them know it was there in very peculiar ways. And, uh, interestingly enough, John Alexander is, uh, I believe he's a congressman. Uh, people can uh, I don't. I'm, he's a very high-ranking person who actually got Bigelow Aerospace the contracts. They're the only ones that are allowed to bring weapons into space because their their main function within you know our reality is they make modules for space stations, and uh, and Robert Bigelow is 
put into the position of looking into new propulsion systems for the powers that be, which is why he's investigating this stuff. But um, John Alexander said that there was three poles that had cameras at the Skinwalker Ranch, and each camera was in uh, eyesight or line of sight of the other cameras. And so there's three, and they're about 12 foot tall, and then there's wire going up to the camera and there's duct tape going down the pole to hold the wire in place and they're watching the video feed from inside uh the ranch house and all of a sudden there's a flash of light and the next thing all the cameras are gone and they said when they went out and investigated not only was the tape it's not like it was just ripped off and laying around the ground it was gone totally gone the cameras were gone the wires were gone had been cut right at the base and they said that there was a whole herd of cattle around these uh, poles as well, and that the cattle would get really skittish if anyone came around, and they would run, you know, and s- separate. And but they said that they were unaffected; like they didn't even know anything had happened. It happened so fast that they weren't bothered at all. And they asked John Alexander, "Well, have your team and the Bigelow team come to any conclusion?" over what what is the intelligence behind these orbs of light that they're experiencing over the Skinwalker Ranch. And he replied, um, their conclusion was that they were up against the trickster. Well, that's a whole other just the term for the Anunnaki, you know. So I, I find it very fascinating that the powers that be know what they are. And, um, and it is a multidimensional phenomenon. These beings can become anything in our physical reality. And I guess no one has really asked the question, what's it like to meet a multidimensional being? That means they're not part of our space-time continuum. You know, they can probably pop in anywhere, you know, to them one second when you're a kid and tell you something and then pop back out and then when you're 20, pop back in. And their next second, but the last 25 years have passed, you know. Um, I think it's a fascinating subject to start to contemplate these things and believe me once i came in contact with them they have shown me the exact same kind of phenomenon like prove that they can communicate to me through my own personal reality and at first like i didn't know about bigelow or anything at first so it was kind of strange i just thought maybe i was going insane you know Mm -hmm. we've uh, had that from uh, other guests how 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 have they uh, uh, changed your life? Have, have they, they given you just more uh, spiritual awareness, uh, music uh, capabilities? Well, yeah, I guess all of the above. Music has been, you know, one of the greatest things in my life, and uh, I've been blessed with some very strange occurrences, which I can tell you, I had a very lucid vision one night and, uh, in it, I was led down a corridor with a guide and it dumped out into a big, like open room at a club. And uh, do you guys know who Steve Vai is by any chance? Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome guy. (laughs) Yeah. Right on. Well, you'll love the story then because uh, I'm a guitarist. So when I seen it with Steve in this vision, I was all excited. I'm like, oh, my God, it's Steve I. Because, you know, I was a big Van Halen fan. And when Dave Lee Roth quit Van Halen, it was Steve I that he got to play guitar for him. So, you know, 1996, I mean, 1986, I knew who Steve I was and I've been following him ever since. But this is in like the year 2000. And I was so excited. And he does this in this vision this lucid dream he was performing a song called there's a train that's leaving and i remember it being really spiritual and in this vision he kind of levitated over to where i was and the music came to this big crescendo and when it stopped he said welcome aboard when he said welcome aboard it was like in this cosmic divine god voice you know from a movie and it actually shocked me so much that it it awoke me out of that vision and I just put it into, I call it the WTF drawer in my mind, you know. When things come up that are just 
weird. I just throw it into that drawer and think, oh, well, what the hell? You know, I don't know what this means. But the next day, I had this nagging feeling that there was some kind of synchronicity waiting for me uh, at Vi.com. And I thought, wouldn't it be weird if he was working on a song called There's a Train That's Leaving? But uh, when I visited Vi.com, the first thing I seen was Enter the Steve Vi Ibanez Guitar Challenge. And the fur went up on the back of my neck. I knew I was going to win that contest. I hadn't even recorded a guitar a guitar note, you know, and my thinking was, well, I just met him in this vision, and he said, welcome aboard, and sure enough, I did end up winning it. Uh, so music has been a very important part of my spiritual growth and my soul outlet for expressing, you know, on all my CDs, I put the CD as an attempt to communicate thoughts, feelings, and emotions regarding our own personal realities that will never be expressed through words. And uh, now that I'm starting to understand cosmic frequency, um, one of the things that I've done, and I'm really proud of this, is I made sure in my recording studio I had my guitar tuned to 432. I was pretty meticulous about it. And I just made a 20-second sound file of me hitting my A note at 432, and I found this company called Cymoscope who... uh, are the leaders in this technology of making the invisible visible of cymatics. And uh, I hired them to image my 20-second sound file with their new scientific equipment. And the result has become kind of historical. Um, first of all, they contacted me and said, we've, we've used this technology to image everything known to man, but they've never imaged an electric rock guitar and they said they've never seen anything that created the kind of complexity or dimensionality of what had come out of this. They said they think it's because I have a Joe Satriani amplifier, and most good guitar amplifiers are tube-based. You know, it's probably one of the only things that uses tubes. And, you know, so to get that Van Halen or Satriani kind of crunchy distortion sound, it's doing very specific things to the, the signal you know, the frequency. And what you need to know too is like, say you have a waveform generator and you're putting a 432 pulse through it. It's just 432. But with an electric rock guitar, there's all these overtones. And right when I tuned from 440 down to 432, I can tell you all these overtones came out. It almost sounded like I had a harmonizer going along with me and it sounded beautiful. And I thought, man, I wonder if my microphones in the studio are even going to pick this up. Well, sure enough, it did. But because of the complexity of this, not only did I get the image from this, which is on my uh, Facebook wall. If you just go to my pictures, you'll see this crazy Mandela-looking thing uh, that's just beautiful. But they asked me for my permission to release uh, the full 20-second audio clip in real time as an experimental video to show it happening in real time. So I gave them permission, and that's now live at cymoscope.com. So the listeners can check that out as well. Go to the video section. Then you'll see in there it says MLH, uh, A note, guitar, uh, whatever. But uh, the cool thing, too, is Nassim Harriman, who is famous astrophysicist and he's the head of the resonance project he kind of took that image under his wing and put it out through his own network of people and it's got over 3,000 likes and shares uh through facebook already um so i'm really proud of uh you know bringing 432 to the world in a visual representation has never been done like this before and it's the first time an image like this has ever existed in this physical reality and uh you know, people can go right now and check it out. So, so yeah, music well, speak, is speaking of which, where can people find you in that? We haven't even mentioned your website uh, yeah, that was, or anything tonight. <laughs> that, that, that right on. Usually was, we make make them make you all do it. You know, before the first break, but uh, right on. We were um, just getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I uh, well, it's michaelleehill.net, and that's my website. And um, if you go to the blog section, I've used the blog on my website as a way to correlate information I'm receiving and put it into the best way I know how to uh, present this information in a concise but yet detailed way. And one of those blogs, you'll see it says electric 
rock guitar image through cymatics for the first time. And it's really interesting because uh, the makers of that scientific equipment um, gets into why 432 is so important and that it's truly a component of light. And also uh, Nassim Harriman's quote, uh, he, he wrote out a real nice paragraph um, for my image that was created. And so you can see there's two actual versions of the image. One, I chose the normal human chakra colors. Uh, but the Native American Indians believe that once a person has went through the ascension, their own personal ascension um, or awakening, that your chakras reverse. So there's another version of the exact same image, but the chakra colors have been reversed. Um, so, yeah, check it out. That's michaelleehill.net. If people want to see my UFO footage, um, they can go to YouTube, and my channel is Frozen Hill, all one word. Um, and that's it. Okay. Um, Michael, my, uh, one of my uh, three native wives asked if you know, know uh, Corey Good. I do. I, I don't know him personally. I know he's he's actually uh, started to reference some of my own work. Um, but again, he's one of the individuals who seems to be putting the Anunnaki and the Nephilim into a negative light. And I don't know if they just don't know about how the true Nephilim bloodline comes through the Native American Indians. Um, and I, you know, like I said, if you if you focus on Team Bad Cop, you're going to get half the story and to get to the truth you know i don't think the truth has ever been gained by just telling half of the story um but i i dig what he's doing all these researchers i like david wilcock i um i think it's all it's accurate if you just look into they're only focusing on team bad cop and like i said i guess i'm here to you know bring the other side of the story and that's inky's Nephilim bloodline that runs through the Native American Indians. And obviously that has nothing to do with the Illuminati or the New World Order or any of these secret societies. Matter of fact, like I said, the Native American Indians have suffered more so. The worst genocide that's ever happened on this planet happened to the Native American Indians by these Illuminati New World Order people. Do uh, do, do you know... uh, you know, which of the uh, you know, uh, mounds and, and er- earthworks in northern uh, Ohio that that yeah you know, has you know, featured in part of this re- renaming of uh, the the mound builder culture? Uh yes, actually, um. Is it in Squire he, Davis's book? Uh, no, because this is brand new information about oh, okay. them encoding uh, these most cosmic harmonious frequencies that are all 432 based into the actual layout and design of the mound sites. And this is what I'm bringing to the table at the Star Knowledge Conference with all the tribal elders here next month. But people right now can go to my website and uh, go to the blog section and you'll see um, – you know, something along the lines, I think I named it, uh, harmonious cosmic frequencies are being encoded into crop circles and mound builders. And I mean, these mound builder locations. And I have pictures of all these different uh, mound sites with the actual dimensions in there and how many times, you know, octaves of 432 are encoded into the actual layout of these places. So this is a real good way, not only... It's going to, if all, if, let me back up. If a mound site is encoding not only these astrological and astronomical information like equinoxes and moon phases, but they also have uh, 432 based information encoded into them. First of all, you know, we've been given the bullshit story that they didn't have written language. Well, there's absolutely this information had to be written somehow to incorporate it over and over and over again into these different mound sites. But it also then can be used as a criteria to say that this is the same culture because the exact same bed of information is being encoded into them. I know Newark is is one of them. Uh, 
Serpent Mound, of course. Uh, by the way, I had a very profound experience at Serpent Mound, and uh, people might not know this, but the the shaman or uh, medicine man factions of the Native American Indians are called the Serpent Tribe or the Serpent Clan. And I was officially brought into uh, that clan and announced as an official member now by the Serpent Clan grandmother. And she told me how to take the energy of the Serpent Mound into my own body to activate my DNA and to bring the wisdom that's stored within the mound. Because I can tell you, uh, Chief Golden Light Eagle was brought into, actually it was the Secret Service for the president because they found out the only thing that would alleviate their... Uh, Secret Service agents' traumatic stress syndrome were sweat lodges, and uh, you need to know how to do them properly or people die. So they actually brought Chief Golden Light Eagle in to show them how to make a uh, a proper sweat lodge and a safe one. And while he was there, he said he learned that they told them that they know with satellites, they know that there's a frequency um, a transmission, a beam that's coming out of Serpent Mound and they can detect it from space. And sometimes it's on and sometimes it's off. But the most powerful that that beam gets is on the equinoxes. Um, So it was interesting because I did that and that's when the Black Hawk Hawk helicopter showed up. You know, I followed her directions and brought the energy into my vessel. Uh, Mike, what you're uh, saying about the frequencies at you know the northern Ohio mounds, it, you know that's characteristic of places like Stonehenge. And you know if you read uh, it, one of the last chapters of uh, Thomas Hardy's *Test of the Durbervilles*, uh, the, the you know. Uh, you know, c- concluding scene or one of the concluding scenes is set at Stonehenge, and he uh, Thomas Hardy does mention uh, uh, that uh, Stonehenge hums. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, he's yeah not uh, writing about the frequencies in the eighteen eighties. I don't know if that was even discovered then. But you know, you, you ha- you, yeah, you could go back 130 years in literature and still s- find the same things being discussed. You know, probably just in different terms. But well, there's what a- I can tell you, it's- a lot of these cultures are the same culture. It's just you know we need a new history book because what's yeah. going to become known is they were here first. And for example, the oldest version of the Ten Commandments ever found on this planet was found in Ohio and taken out of a mound in Newark, the Newark Earthworks. Um, Similarly, in Ohio, there was a menorah uh, here, which predates Egypt. And um, some of the math that's encoded into these earth mounds as well are encoded into the pyramids in Egypt. What's going to become known is they were here first. Then they went you know, and, and set up the Sumerian culture and then became the Egyptian culture. And the exact same math is encoded into all of it. But what this gets into as well, I wasn't religious before all of this. I'm still not religious in a normal sense, but this is truly the revealing of one of the lost tribes of Israel. Because uh, one of the only other places haplogroup X2A is found is ancient Israel. So you got Israel, the mound builder, uh, skeletal remains, and Native American Indians still to this day. And it's really strange because, as I said, what I found out is East Lake, Ohio, is home base for this culture in North America once they came up through the continent and settled here. Well, people can go to Google Earth, go to, you know, Street View or whatever it's called, type in Ohio Lost Nation. Imagine that, right? Uh, Lost Nation Road is a road in this area. East Lake is my hometown, by the way, and it's where I filmed all these UFOs. And because of the work I did with, uh, you know, the NSA remote viewers, 
uh, the head of that said, Michael, you know what's underneath you in that area, don't you? And I said, not really. And he said, it's one of the oldest underground bases in the world, and it's not ours. And so it makes perfect sense that the oldest underground base, Anunnaki base, is in this area under Lake Erie. And uh, But anyhow, so you take Lost Nation all the way up until dead ends where Lake Erie is. And then there's a road that goes along the shoreline of Lake Erie called uh, Lakeshore Boulevard. And when you take a left, within about one mile, you'll be at the site of the first site of the Mound Builders. And it's where East Lake Middle School sits there now. Um, because they destroyed it long ago. But this site had mound walls that were 660 feet long, which is also 432 based, by the way. Um, it's a little bit much to get into right now, but it's that information is at my website. But it all revolves around 432, the 660, because you find out a lot of these mounds... Well, we can get into this. I, uh, I asked Chief Golden Light Eagle, I said... What do the Native American Indians have their flutes tuned to? Is it 432? And he said, no, um, it's 444, which is an Arcturian frequency, he told me. He said, you need to look into how 444 relates to 528 and 432 and how they're all related. And I said, well, okay, didn't know how I was going to do that. But then it occurred to me. I, I know this is going to sound crazy, but since the, this time I've come across, I've met in person uh, this gentleman who is an Arcturian ambassador. And he told me, Michael, you know how we've been given this idea of multiplying or dividing a whole unit by 12, whether it's 12 hours in a day or 12 months in a year, 12 inches in a foot. You know, the list just goes on and on and on and on. Um, he said, what happens if you take... 440 and divide it by 12 and I did that and the answer is 36.6666666666 the sixes go on to about 15 places it's pretty weird he said isn't that interesting it's pretending to be sacred geometry while still being an imposter is what he said and by the way all the octaves of 432 like 4, 3 and 2 if you add them together is 9 it's lower octave of 216 is 9 216 uh, 108 1 plus 8 is 9 54, 9, 27, 9. Well, uh, he said, what happens when you take 432 and divide it by 12? You get a perfect 36. 3 and 6 is 9. Nikolai Tesla said, when we understood the magnificence of the 3, the 6, and the 9, that we would unlock the keys to the universe. Well, 369 is another way of stating 432 because 432 divided by 12 is 36. Anyhow, it occurred to me, I wonder what happened if you just took whole numbers and just kept using this method. So if you take 36 times 12, it's 432. I wondered what's 37 times 12. Well, it's 444. Then I kept going until I got to 44 times 12, and it's 528. I thought, holy shit. You know, here, first of all, there's in new age communities, there's this division like humans always do like split everything down the middle and 528 people are going 432 people don't know what they're talking about the you know the most harmonious frequency is 528 and the 528 people are saying 432 you know there's this division and truly it's not they're not in competition with one another they're perfect mathematical and musical overtones but the reason i'm even bringing this up is using the same method when you get to 55 times 12 is 660 and what you'll find over and over and over again, not only are these earth mounds incorporating octaves of 432, but some of the circles will have 660-foot circumferences. And right. it's a, a whole other way of devising information, 432-based, because the only way that these two beds of information are related is 432. So, uh, you know, the East Lake site having walls that were 660 feet long are – very important. But what's happening right now is, uh, so again, you take Lost Nation to the end of, until it dead ends at Lake Erie, and uh, take a left within one mile, you're at the site of the first Mount Builders location ever. But if you take a right, it's written into our street names in this area, which are really old street names, by the way. Um, the first road you come to is Iroquois, 
Then you got uh, Seneca, Mohawk, which Seneca and Mohawk are both tribes of the Iroquois tribe. Um, Iroquois is not one tribe of Indians. It's a whole confederacy of, it was originally five. It was a nation. Most people don't realize that. They think they were just savages and they weren't. No, they had a, you know, that's what's being revealed too is they had functioning cities here that were bigger than any cities on in the planet at this time. And they functioned very highly and had trade coming in here like Cahokia in St. Louis is a huge complex where they just announced this recently. People can do St. Louis, Cahokia, um, ancient city found. It was uh, pretty much just revealed in the news. And it had a mound, a pyramidal mound there that was bigger than the pyramid in Giza. Yeah, there was a very high functioning level of uh, culture here but um yeah so if you go to the right and people can again go to google maps and you can see it for yourself it's what it's like a road map of what happened to the lost nation and uh what happened to it was you know the next tree is cherokee because people might not know cherokee is uh, another their dna relatives it's the same dna as, as the iroquois uh is Cherokee. Then the next road was Tioga. And I'm like, well, what the hell is Tioga? I go on Google. I type it in. Here it means Peaceful Valley in uh, uh, Iroquois language. So matter of fact, that's my own. Uh, I'm Because I'm involved right now with the East Lake Historical Society, I'm bringing the tribal elders from the Star Knowledge Conference here next year to announce this to the world, that this was the first site of the Mound Builders. And the uh, the Cleveland Natural History Museum is in the process of a multi-million dollar renovation that's going to be uh, incorporating all this. For example, I've taken pictures of some of the artifacts that were removed from this East Lake Mound site. And Clifford Mahuti, who is one of the elders of the, the Zuni, uh, he got really excited because one of the artifacts has a petroglyph that's on the Zuni reservation wall. And that's actually it goes back to Sumeria as well. And it's inky and it's a, it's like a star cross symbol. Um, so a lot of cool stuff is going to be happening with this. And uh, this is, truly is the new well, Jerusalem. You know, it's where the lost nation went. Well, my, we only have a few minutes and I want to make sure everybody can find you. And uh, I sure appreciate you coming on tonight. You brought us a little, quite a bit of information and, uh, a little bit of mind candy. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Well, michaelleehill.net is my uh, website, and there's a lot of information there. And uh, my YouTube page is Frozen Hill. It's all one word. Uh, and uh, that's about it. Are, are you going to be speaking at any conferences? Yes, indeed. And uh, – uh, December 12th, 13th, and 14th is the Star Knowledge Conference, which is um, all the tribal elders from all over the world have got, as, as far as, you know, their own words, is they've got word from spirit that it's time to release what they've, the knowledge that they've gained from thousands of years of contact with star beings. Um, and uh, right before that, in December 3rd, in Columbus is the Angels and Aliens Conference, and I'm also speaking there. And um, oh, oh, where's the uh, Star Knowledge Conference being held? That's in Estes Park, Colorado. That's up in the mountains there, where the Shining Hotel is, where they oh. film The Shining. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, it's cool to be able to get to travel. By the way, I'm really. You can imagine, as I said, I didn't know my Indian heritage. So when I found out that I was Iroquois, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be cool to be able to meet the elders and learn what they've known? And I I thought, well, there's no way I would ever be able to meet many elders. How the hell would that happen? And then I met Chief Golden Light Eagle, and he asked me to come and speak at these conferences. And uh, for the first time at this one, I'm being brought in as a keynote speaker, which I'm very honored and uh I just it blows my mind that I've got to meet people like Bear Bear Cloud, which is another uh, tribal elder, and just be able to learn from these people, and just be around them because I'll tell you what, it's a breath of fresh air. These people truly uh, know treat each other with respect. 
Well, uh, we sure appreciate you coming on tonight, and uh, we hope to have you back soon. Uh, right on. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Michael. There, there's the music. We'll be back next week with uh, Nick Redfern. Thanks, Michael. Great show. Chat room has been uh, praising you for the last <laughs> half hour. <laughs> they, they've enjoyed cool, it. All right, y'all have a good evening. Peace. Peace it out.